Hello, welcome to the Mad Knitting YouTube channel. Today is Monday, February 27, 2023, and I'm so happy you're here. My name is Susan, my pronouns are she, hers, and you can find me elsewhere online as Madtown Mama on Ravelry and Madtown underscore Mama on Instagram. I really, really like to talk about knitting and crafting in general and yarn and all of those things. So I finally made a YouTube channel about it. I jumped on that bandwagon in October, 2021, and I'm still going. So welcome. My usual format is to talk about things that I've finished, things I'm working on, and then whatever else comes to mind. Um, my last episode, which I posted only a week ago, normally I don't post this often, uh, but anyway, I decided to do a special topic talking about stash. I didn't show my whole stash, but I did talk about my approach to it, my attitude about it, and um, I showed off just a small portion of it and kind of talked about why I collected those yarns, for what purpose. So I might revisit that idea or other special topics from time to time. Today is just a regular one. It's probably not going to be too long because... I just, I don't have a whole lot to show you since my last regular episode, but um, I do have one finished object that needs to get sent to the recipient. So I thought I would go ahead and record for today. Um, the lighting, I hope is gonna be okay. Um, we are having really lousy weather. It's been raining all day and it's very gray and gloomy. So the whole natural light situation isn't really happening very well. Um, I wouldn't be a Midwesterner if I didn't talk about the weather, like all the time. Uh, yeah, so that's that. Um, I have no desire to make money doing this. I, um, do not seek to become an influencer or gain a lot of followers or anything. So hence <laughs> the equipment I use for these videos, I have this really janky tripod that I do want to upgrade at some point. Um, but I just use my phone camera to do this. Um, I don't have a special light or a microphone or anything. So I know that you can get those things without spending too much money, but I'm just not interested in doing that at this time. So I kind of take the light as I can get it and hope for the best. Um, today, I'm going to show you one finished project. This is a gift. And I had started these the last time I did a regular episode. I have a pair of socks for my father-in-law. His birthday is this week, so I really need to get them sent off. I finished them last night. It was a real push, but I really wanted to get them done in order to send them to him. They're both the same, but I'll show you each sock anyway. I don't use a pattern. For these, I used size one and a half needles and <laughs> there was a false start. I started off casting on 68 stitches and I got almost all the way, like I was about this far on the foot with the first sock and it was clear that they were way too big. Um, my husband, I think his feet are about the same size as his dad's, so I had him try them on and it was like, baggy all like on the ankle across the top of the foot I just I had to rip the whole thing out and start over so for these I cast on 60 stitches with size one and a half needles and they fit much much better fortunately when you cast on fewer stitches it's faster to knit the sock anyway um, I don't use a pattern I just have kind of this formula that I use to make socks 60 stitches I start from the cuff two by two rib, plain leg. I really like an eye of partridge heel. I think this shows up pretty well. So it slipped stitches and on every right side row, you're alternating either knit one, slip one, knit one, slip one, or slip one, knit one, slip one, knit one. So you get this nice checkerboard pattern. And then I have a three stitch garter along the edge of that heel so that it's easy to pick up the stitches. And then typical toe decreases. I prefer not to graft the end of the toe. I just 
get down to the last 16 stitches, knit two together all the way around and pull the yarn through. Voila, way easier than grafting. And it fits just as well. So I used, I'm gonna tell you about the yarn and I'm gonna tell you some more things about socks for my father-in-law. I used Knit Picks Hawthorne, which I, th I think this yarn is heavier than most sock yarn I'm used to. It's getting close to sport weight. And I think that's why I was having trouble with the size. Um, I've used this to make socks for my son before, but his feet are evidently much bigger <laughs> than his own father or his grandfather, which is why I overestimated how big they need to be. Um, I use Knit Picks Hawthorne. The color is Newport Hand Paint, which is this nice sort of cool tan color. Um, very neutral. I think it's a great color for somebody who likes very understated neutrals. Um, guys like my husband and his dad, for example, <laughs> very appropriate for them. So I'm really, really happy with this. And I know that Hawthorne wears well because the socks for my son, he wears all the time and they've, they've held up very nicely. So let me tell you about making socks for my father-in-law. Um, I told you a little bit about that in the last, not the last episode, but the one where I talked about these socks. Um, he wore the last pair I made him, which I made them probably 15 years ago. They lived in a different state. It was ages ago, um, but he wore them when we were visiting for the holidays. On Christmas Day, he decided to wear things that he had been given. So he had a shirt and a belt and then these socks that I had made. And I was kind of flabbergasted that those socks had lasted this long. But I thought, here's a guy who needs another pair of hand knit socks because he clearly likes them. Uh, they live in North Carolina, so there's not much call for wearing warm wool socks, but it does get cold there on occasion. And uh, yeah, so he's definitely deserving of another pair. The thing is, this is those socks are not the first pair I've made him. I learned how to knit socks more than 20 years ago when I was in graduate school for the first round. Um, I was studying piano performance and pedagogy and one of my really good friends there was in the same program and she, we found out after we'd known each other for a little bit that we were both knitters and it was very exciting. And at that time, I only knew how to follow patterns like to the T to make sweaters. That's basically all I knew how to do. And she totally opened my world by teaching me how to use double pointed needles to make socks. So once she taught me that, and once I learned the techniques and the basic construction of making socks, uh, I was off to the races. And at this time, double point needles, I think were basically the only method that people used. So that's how I learned and that's what I'm comfortable doing. Um, I'm not sure if there were toe up techniques at that point, there probably were, but the way I learned was cuff down and so that's how I always do it. Anyway, I was so excited about making socks that I started making socks for everybody. Um, that's how I learned that my husband does not like hand knit socks. So he has gotten one pair. It's the first and last and only pair he's ever getting from me because he doesn't really like to wear them. Um, so that was, you know, years and years and years ago. But I decided to make his father a pair of hand knit socks. And for some reason, I did not pay attention whatsoever to the yarn I was using. I remember, I don't remember the brand, but I remember that it was navy blue and it was maybe a sport weight, but my mistake was that I used wool that had not been treated to be washable. So they were probably a Christmas present. Anyway, my father-in-law, bless his heart, wore these socks one time <laughs> and then they went in the wash and of course they felted and shrank and were completely unwearable after that. Um, that was my fault. That was my bad for not using the proper yarn for them. I would not expect anybody to hand wash hand knit socks. I don't even like to hand wash hand knit socks. So anyway, that is at least part of the story of my sock making journey. 
And these, I'm afraid, are my only finished object for you today. Um, and there's, you know, there's a fair amount of yarn left. I'm not sure what I will do with it. I'll just sort of chuck it in the leftover bin and maybe it'll get used for something else. Waste yarn, if nothing else. I do have a couple of works in progress to share. The first one I'll show you is this Rose and Honey shawl. I'm in the middle of a row, evidently. I have not made a whole lot of progress since the last time I talked about it because I was so focused on getting those socks done. But I have knit a little bit like during meetings and stuff. Um, I really love this thing. I was really, really, really hoping that I would get it done by the end of February because part of the reason I cast it on was that the black knitter, Liz, um, she's on Instagram and YouTube and she has a Ravelry group too, actually. She is hosting a Black History Month make along and I am knitting this as part of that. Uh oh, sorry about that little jiggle. Um, I am knitting this shawl as part of that because the designer is Gabriella Treminio. Treminio? I'm not exactly sure how to say her last name. Um, and then one of the yarns I'm using is by Neighborhood Fiber Company. Here's the label. Y'all should be proud of me. I have my labels today. Um, but I haven't even started. It's rustic fingering and I haven't even started the second skein. So the chances that I'm going to get this finished before the end of February are pretty much zilch. Um, but it's so meditative to knit this pattern. Um, there are enough changes along the way that it keeps you engaged, but it's not, there's no chart to follow. It's not difficult or complex. Um, it's just really, really soothing to knit and very enjoyable. And it feels wonderful because that rustic fingering is really soft. And then the other yarn I'm carrying along with it is Knit Picks Aloft, which is a mohair silk blend. I was kind of late to the trend to um, carry mohair silk or, you know, a, a fuzzy lace weight yarn along with another yarn on something like that's been trendy for a few years now. And I finally tried it a little over a year ago and I, man, I love it. Like I am firmly at that party and not leaving probably even after, <laughs> even after it's not popular anymore. I'll be doing this because I just, I love the feel. I don't find it itchy and I think this is going to be so warm and cozy when it's done. I can't wait to finish it. So it'll get done. It's, it's top priority. Well, everything's top priority. It's high on the priority list. Um, but anyway, that's, that's one thing I have in progress. And I just, I kind of don't want to put it down because it feels so nice right now. The other work in progress I have, um, I sort of have this constant churn of gift knitting. Um, it's just something I like to do. It motivates me to get things done. Um, it motivates me to use things up in my stash. So I just, I just really enjoy gift knitting. So I've decided to make a hat for my husband. He has other hats that I've made him but I haven't made him a new one in a while. And when I asked him a little while ago what color he might like, he said, how about red? I don't have any red hats. Um, he's actually got red hair. <laughs> if you've ever met him or seen him and my daughter, you would be, you would immediately know that they're related because they both have like the same beautiful kind of auburn colored red hair. Anyway. So the shade of red that he prefers to wear is kind of this, is a sort of dark maroon leaning. So I'm making him a hat in that color. This is Cascade Eco Plus. Um, I think it's supposed to be a bulky weight yarn, but I think of it kind of, whoops, as a heavy Aran weight. Um, I don't know what the color is. I, the label is long gone. I got this for something else. Um, and used part of it and had a whole bunch left. If you're not familiar with the Cascade Eco yarn, um, there are these huge hanks. They're either 200 or 250 grams. So you get like 450 yards in one 
giant hank. So like if you want to make a sweater, you can probably do that in two or three hanks of these yarn, depending on what size you're making and what, you know, what kind of fabric you're getting. So I'm just doing a plain one by one ribbed hat. I'm not using a pattern. I cast on with size 10 needles, um, which my preference would have been size nine, but I couldn't find a pair of 16 inch circulars in size nine. So I just picked up size 10 because that's the next closest one. I didn't want to go smaller because I didn't want it to be too stiff. So I've got 80 stitches. Because of the bigger needles, it's like very nice and stretchy. It's thick enough yarn, I think it'll be very warm. This is very similar to the hat that I made for my son for his birthday, only my husband said he does like to have the brim to turn up. He likes to have options. So this, I just cast this on this morning when I was having my morning coffee and I knit on it during a meeting and I've already got this much. So I don't think it's gonna take much time at all to finish this. My husband's birthday is in the middle of March, so he's gonna be getting this at that time. And living where we do, we could have another blizzard at that time, or it could be 60 degrees. Either way, it's not a bad thing to have a hat ready in March, ready to wear. So those are the only two things I have to show you that I'm working on. I have languishing sweater projects that I wanna get back to, but the shawl is, I want to get that done before I start anything, get back to any like big major project. Um, and I have lots of ideas in my brain for um, presents for my nieces. They both have spring birthdays. Um, there's Easter coming up. We'll see what I end up doing with that. I kind of don't want to talk about it until I get started on it because I'm constantly making plans and then changing them and then realizing I don't have time, blah, 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 blah. I do have a sewing project to show you though. I had shared this in progress. Um, I forget what episode, it was a little while ago. But uh, what I did was a little bit before Christmas, I had gone into Blue Bar Quilts, which is a, my just a lovely local quilt shop here. And I bought some fat quarters on a whim and started improvise not improvising quilt blocks, but I just made quilt blocks without really a plan for what to do with them. The, I'll show you the project in a second. The book I was using is this, it's by Tula Pink, 100 Modern Quilt Blocks. Tula Pink has kind of a cult following. I'm not like super into her fabrics necessarily, but I really like this book because it presents so many options. It's so clearly laid out and she's got a few examples of entire quilts showing every block that's in the book. So you kind of get an idea of what it would look like if you combined these different designs. Like here's one, this is kind of cool. Sort of looks like skyscrapers, but it's all these different block designs stacked up. Um, yeah, there's a bunch. Here's one that's kind of a rainbow, arranged like in a rainbow. I don't know if it's focusing. Anyway, it's just, it's really fun to make these blocks and just kind of see how they turn out. So I made eight of them. And I decided to, I, after I made them, I decided to put them in a tote bag. I do not recommend necessarily improvising sewing projects as you go, and yet I do it all the time. So you can see my basic idea was to take a dark fabric and then some version of a mustard or gold fabric for the accent or focal color. I don't know. There's a lot of quilting terminology I don't really know. Um, and I put them together and then I decided, well, this tote bag is going to be big enough that it should have some depth. So then I added strips down the side and the bottom. So 
After seam allowance, I think this added three inches to the depth. Um, and then things got a little tricky because I wanted it lined and I wanted a drawstring at the top and I knew I wanted handles because it's, it's big enough I thought separate handles would be good. And I thought maybe I want pockets in here too. And of course I hadn't planned through any of this. I was just kind of measuring and cutting and winging it. And um, it was going really well until it was not. Um, I had issues figuring out how to attach the handles to the inside. Um, I started off putting pockets on the inside, but they just, they weren't placed very well and the top got caught in the stitching around the, the, the edge here. So they were like pockets that were sewed up at the top and thus useless. Um, the other problem with having top pockets so close to the top of the bag is that anything you put in there is more likely to fall out or stick up. Um, so anyway, I just ended up I had to take everything out and redo it and I ended up just abandoning the idea of pockets inside, which is fine. I can just, I can live without them. Um, but I'm really, really happy with the way it turned out. I put interfacing in, but it's pretty light. So the bag is really floppy. Like this is not going to stand up on its own, you know, maybe if it was totally full of yarn, it would, but it, it doesn't really work like a basket. It's just, just kind of a nice big tote bag, but I'm happy with it because I make a lot of sweaters and larger projects or um, if I'm going on a trip sometimes I like to have several projects with me so I'll stick like two or three smaller project bags inside a bigger one so that I have like a sock and a hat and maybe a child sweater or something. Um, so I think this will work very nicely for that. And here it is with the drawstring pulled so that things wouldn't fall out. So yeah, I'm happy with it. I do realize that there are many bag patterns out there for purchase that are probably a whole lot better designed than this. Noodlehead is one really good one. I've even bought some of her patterns and not made them yet. And they're, they look really fantastic. I just, I don't know. There's just something very freeing about making this and figuring it out on my own. And I felt very clever once I finally had it all done and was through the frustrating phase. So, or through the frustrated phase. So that is my sewing project. I'm gonna take just a couple of minutes to talk about a book that I started reading the other day. Um, I go back and forth about whether it's worth talking about books on this channel. Um, I'm always reading, I'm a real bookworm, but I find it difficult to talk about books in a way that's really engaging and interesting. Every once in a while, I'll have something that's so good and so compelling, I feel like I have to talk about it, but I don't know. I don't particularly find it interesting to listen to other people talk about books that I haven't read. So <laughs> anyway, I'll keep it short. But this one is just, I keep thinking about it, so I just thought I would share about it. Um, and I'm not super far into it. This is called The Book of Difficult Fruit by Kate Lebo. Um, this was a birthday present someone gave me and I finally started reading it the other day. It's like part memoir. Uh, it's got recipes in it, just a lot of really quirky information. And she goes through the entire alphabet and has some fruit or plant of some kind that she talks about that like most people wouldn't even, you know, that this just not like common. So for example, um, and she has to get pretty creative with her chapter names in order to hit every letter of the alphabet. For example, last night I was reading the chapter on face clock, which is another name for dandelion. And of course, dandelions are edible. The blooms are edible. The leaves are edible. The roots you can roast and make into tea, uh, which I've never tried any of those. I have bought dandelion root tea, but I've never made any of these things. Um, but she just talks about all these unusual ways that you can treat 
these different fruits. Um, including things that are like toxic. She has a chapter on cherries. And of course, you know, cherry is a very common fruit. We know about it. Um, but a lot of what she's talking about in that chapter is how to make um, extract with the pits that taste like almond. And of course, cherry pits have cyanide in them, so you really can't eat too much of it. Um, it's really best to take a little bit and like put it in a pie filling and when you bake it, the cyanide cooks out. Um, but yeah, it's just, it's just kind of weird and quirky and fascinating and I'm really enjoying this book. I have yet to encounter a recipe in here that I will make, seems unlikely, um, but you never know. So I recommend it, it's, it's a fun read and she just seems like a really interesting kind of quirky person which comes through in the writing. But the, the chapter on cherry, so I'm gonna digress for just a couple minutes, reminded me of, um, there was this one year in Kentucky when, um, so I grew up in Kentucky. I actually grew up in the bluegrass area of Kentucky. So that is like right in horse country. Um, the house where we, we lived, uh, where my parents still are, is like a 15 minute drive from the Kentucky Horse Park where the World Equestrian Games were held back in the 2000s. Um, the Queen of England, when she was alive, she used to come visit every once in a while because she either had horses there or trained there or something. Um, anyway, it's like a world-class place for horses. Now, I was a child obsessed with horses. I think a lot of kids go through that phase, especially little girls, but growing up where I did, it was like especially strong. I was obsessed with horses. I would draw them. I would dream about, you know, daydream about riding them. It was, it was like a whole thing for a while. Anyway, um, there was one season when it was, it was so tragic. A lot of horses were dying and it took a long time for the vets in the area to figure out what was going on. Um, I remember that a good friend of mine from high school, his dad worked as a veterinarian and he was just, you know, he was hardly sleeping because he was on call so much and it was just so hard to see these animals dying and they couldn't figure out what was going on. Um, and it turned out that that year, I think was exceptionally dry and the horses were eating, maybe they were eating leaves off of cherry trees. And maybe there was also something wrong with the grass, but it was so dry that poison, you know, toxins that occur in nature were so concentrated that it was poisoning them to death. So I think it was maybe cyanide from eating um, leaves off the cherry trees that were in these pastures and Maybe there was some arsenic also that was concentrated in, in the grass they were eating, but it was really sad. But I was just, you know, reading the chapter on cherries and cherry pits and the whole deal with how there's cyanide in there and what you have to do to make sure you don't get cyanide poisoning just made me think of that. So anyway, I recommend this book if you want a good read and learn some weird quirky trivia about different kinds of plants and, and their fruits. That is all for today. I will see you in a couple of weeks. Thanks for watching.